<laughs> Hi Tom, uh, so I'm so happy you accepted uh, my invitation and uh, as I uh, started, this is the third uh, thought-provoking conversation that I'm recording with people and I really like that first question that I'm asking people to answer, so I would repeat uh, to you as well, uh, who is Tom? Oh, it's a wonderful question. Uh, <laughs> I am, <laughs> there, there are so many ways uh, I could start, uh, but I am a, a teacher um, at a high school in New Hampshire, a boarding high school, um, where I teach about religion, um, religious identity, uh, global ethics, human rights. Um, I teach about conflict and coexistence in our world, so I try to help um, young people, I try to help youth uh, think about um, the big questions in their lives, the big questions of meaning and purpose and value. Um, and I love those conversations. I learned so much from my students about those conversations. I also live uh, in a dormitory apartment. So I, I have uh, 35 to 40 students who live in a dormitory that's attached uh, to my apartment. Um, and so I, I mentor them and, and guide them in their lives. Um, I also help coach a baseball team here at the school. Um, so I'm involved in all aspects of, of school life. Um, I, I live here with my family. I have a wife, uh, Alexis, uh, who is involved in uh, local politics. And she's also a, a faith leader in the community. She's a minister um, working for... Uh, racial and social justice and uh, environmental s sustainability. Um, and we have two lovely young boys. Uh, they're 15 and 13. Uh, they're rock musicians and they're into all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> yeah, like drumming and guitar and skateboarding and um, school and, and all those things. So, we, um, so, I, so I'm a, a father, I'm a partner, um, a son, a brother, um, all these all these things, I, and, and we'll talk about later too, I, I enjoy writing very much too. A lot of what I do is, is uh, poured into different kinds of writing as well. So uh, you mentioned uh, that you uh, speak with your students uh, about uh, identities, different kinds of identities. So I'm really interested uh, you to say something about that. It's, uh, for me, it's, uh, something that is still abstract uh, uh, concept and I'm also as an artist uh, researching that <laughs> that concept so what's identity for you and how how you explain your students uh, about identity well that's such a beautiful question I um, I think for for teenagers, it's it's very it's a very live question. It's a very real question because they're just really starting to be able to reflect on who they are um, and and what has made them who they are and who they want to be. And so I think as a teacher, mostly we sometimes we have kind of philosophical conversations about identity and and um, but mostly I try to. Um, expose them to a, a, a lot of stories of, of different people. Like I, I try to present a lot of stories of people I admire to them. And I also try to give them a lot of opportunities to explore who they are becoming um, and, and what their questions are. Um, and so a lot of my students, most of my students are living away from home. Um, and so they're, uh, they're reflecting on their home identity, like they're reflecting on where they come from and they're reflecting on who they are now, who they are becoming. Um, and so in a lot of cases, I, I want them to think about what um, their home life and home culture has given them in terms of resources and sustenance and nourishment. Um, but they also might need some help thinking about how they want to become their own person um, and how they, um, you know, so this is often the most diverse environment that my students have lived in. So they're living with students from all over the United States. They're living from, with students from many different countries. Um, and so just thinking about who am I in this very diverse environment, and that connects to 
all of the questions we're talking about in class. Like how do we, um, you know, we, we just see that societies and communities can either move in the direction of conflict or they can move in the direction of vibrant coexistence. Um, and, and how do we, how do we allow ourselves to flourish as individuals and how do we allow ourselves to flourish as a community, I think is what makes this work so exciting to me and how I can imagine doing it for the rest of my life is we, we, we're always having to face those questions as communities and as families and uh, as societies. So uh, for you, for, from your personal point of view, uh, when we're speaking about uh, conflict, is that something that you can connect uh, with not being able to create and reflect? And if you can say a little bit more, maybe uh, it's a difficult question, but uh, uh, do students have that kind of questions uh, about uh, conflicts either in themselves or, uh, or a community uh, they are uh, they are in or something like that are they concerned with the uh, with their position uh, as someone who is not uh, grown up and not young as well like a small child or something like that like that kind of transition that when they have some kind of conflict in themselves because when i remember myself that was maybe the really challenging part of my life and it's kind of you are not responsible for many things but also uh, you are going to that kind of transition where you are you're becoming one grown up yes yeah that's uh, such a such an important set of questions um and it really is a, a crucial stage of transition for for young people right um that, and and uh, I think for them, they've grown up in such uh, what a fraught um, environment. And we're, I mean, to think about what young people are having to process right now in the world in, in terms of what they see, they see a lot of times that adults are really struggling for answers and for, and I think back to your original question, I think about whether we can, be creative enough and reflective enough to find a path forward in this moment. I think that's probably the most important question of the 21st century. Um, <laughs> like, because I think like my own children and my students um, see that adults are struggling. Adults that we're, we're, but there's also, they also see things that are exciting. Uh, like they, I think, you know, I try to communicate to them that I think in terms of racial justice, this is one of the most exciting moments. I, I, I don't think in my lifetime I've seen so much momentum in the direction of asking the hard questions about racial justice in the United States. It's incredible. And then my kids and the students I teach with issues of gender and sexuality, those issues of identity, they are so um, fluent and and fluid they they just they understand that there's a spectrum of gender identities and a, you know and that they they don't have to live with the same kind of um suffocating binary um choices that that so many people in my generation grew up with and it was it was so hard um in my high school if if you were um if you were questioning your sexuality or something it was it was very difficult to be open about that when i was growing up and i think it's it's still a challenge for a lot of students today, but there's more, there's much more support. There's much more um, ability to speak openly about the struggles that you might be going through and know that there are adults in the community who will support you in that journey and that process. So I'm hopeful in that sense. I see incredible creativity and reflection going on among my students, among activists, uh, in the United States um, and across the world, um, but the challenges are are real. Um, I, just to see, I think at the same time that I've seen so much momentum in the direction of exploring questions of racial justice and gender equality, um, I think the the attacks on democracy in the United States are as strong 
as they've ever been. I think that we're seeing a kind of unraveling of some of the, um, the basic institutions that we need to foster healthy coexistence. I mean, the attacks on immigrants, the attacks, you know, mass incarceration of, of black people. Um, there's, there's, there are some things that are horrifying right now that are going on. And uh, yeah, we need all the creativity and reflection and solidarity um, that we can muster. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, because uh, uh, you teach a human rights class, and that's something that's kind of new for me. I haven't, uh, in the past, I haven't uh, researched so much about that kind of particular topic. And I heard about that uh, kind of concept only on uh, TV. And uh, how did you became, become uh, to, uh, interested in, in human rights and uh, uh, how did you decide that uh, to teach that to students uh, why that interest interest in, in yeah. human rights boy the the short answer to that question is by um traveling to bosnia uh and my the first time i went was in 2004 with a a program i was directing um at emory university in atlanta it was a program called Journeys of Reconciliation, and uh, the, it's a, a travel program for students, faculty, and staff um, where you do immersion experiences for about 10 days to two weeks in areas of the world where, um, where you can explore these, con these questions of um, religious identity, conflict, um, peace building, so some of the some of the trips would go to um, South Africa, some would go to Northern Ireland, um, so, and some would go to Israel and the Palestinian occupied territories, uh, and some would go to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and so when I was directing that program in 2003 and 2004, when I was a graduate student, um, the uh, the first international trip I went on was to Bosnia and. Uh, it's it opened my eyes to a lot of these questions uh so in in my um previous academic training in my previous life uh i was very much interested in these questions of religious identity very much interested in questions of racial and social justice uh very much interested in questions of feminism and gender equality um but bosnia my time there distilled and um uh, what crystallized a lot of these questions about um, how do you how do you build and maintain a flourishing society and also and my first real the first question that hit me so hard about Bosnia was what would possess what would possess people to destroy um, people and places that are so beautiful you know and so it just it really hit me on a heart and a gut level that uh, how beautiful Bosnia was, how beautiful the people were, how kind and hospitable the people were. Um, I loved the the art and the architecture. I loved the food. I loved, uh, so much of it was just very moving to me on an emotional level. And then the question, the question that has really, I think, haunted me ever since has been just what, again, what would possess people almost demonically or something what would what would possess people to decide that they should destroy people who are so beautiful what what would possess them to destroy the national library you know what would possess them to destroy all of these mosques and and you know and, and monuments but all these all these signs of cultural vitality and cultural coexistence um and it, it really uh, took me down that path and then so it's so the more that I talked with people from Bosnia and the more that I learned from people in Bosnia, the more I understood that kind of human rights language was a, a reference point for them. Um, so, so especially in terms of people being displaced from their homes or um, people not, people needing access to um, real justice and even ask, just asking questions like what is justice for people who have suffered so much, you know, and, um, and that, that I found that human rights um, concepts and language um, about refugees and about uh, 
um, about these kind of mass killings and genocides. Um, it just, it opened my eyes to how these are global realities um, that, that Bosnia kind of um, is, is um, Bosnia exemplifies a lot of the mm-hmm. issues that, and these patterns that happen in lots of different places around the world. Um, so that it just opened my mind um, to some of these patterns of, uh, of genocidal violence, of, um, of you know, targeting innocent people in conflict, targeting women, targeting a child just because of their identity often, mm-hmm. um, or because they present some kind of threat to a nas- an aggressive nationalist identity. Um, so that's really how I got interested. And then just by luck, um, I ended up teaching here at Phillips Exeter Academy in a department. So I, I'm, I'm housed in a religion department essentially, but we also teach courses on ethics and philosophy. And one of the courses we teach commonly is a course on human rights. And the woman who was teaching that class uh, retired early in my time here, and I volunteered to teach the class. And so I've been teaching it now for maybe seven or eight years, and I've just loved it. It's one of my favorite, favorite classes to teach. So uh, uh, what do you, you teach a lot of like really complex <laughs> subjects. So I also have a question about teaching. It's, uh, kind of universal topic and uh, what did you learn over the years about teaching? Uh, is it a hard uh, uh, a hard position uh, for one individual to be teacher? Yes, very, very. And that's what the fact that it's so challenging on a daily basis is what keeps me doing it. Um, it, it it's very, it's, it's never boring. It's, <laughs> it's never, <laughs> and with teenagers especially, Teenagers, what I what I love about them is they will they will not hide anything from you. Like if you are boring them, they will, like, <laughs> they will just they will stop listening or they'll stop paying attention. And and so especially like I used to teach at the college level, um, and and I would lecture a lot, and students would kind of dutifully listen and take notes. But now I teach in a high school setting in a a round table seminar and I'm not supposed to lecture. We, we really pride ourselves on not lecturing. And so we, we have to put, as teachers, we have to put a lot of thought into what kinds of readings and other materials will be engaging for teenagers, what will um, be thought provoking for them. And so I learned very early on that I can't just assume that they will that they will be passionate about what I am passionate about. You know, and so I have to find ways to invite them into the material. And I also have to find out what they're genuinely interested in. Like, you know, so, and what I love is my classes give me all kinds of ways to ask them, but like just how are you doing? Like, how are you doing with the news? Are you watching the news? Um, is it overwhelming to watch the news? And can we talk about that? So it's, we have all this freedom to talk about how they're navigating their worlds. Um, and so, but the biggest challenge for me, I think has been finding like where, you know, I have a lot of questions I want them to, or that I hope they will wrestle with, but sometimes they need, they need points of entry. They need, um, they need ways to understand why my questions might matter to them. And I might need to reframe my questions so that they do matter to them. I'm, I'm remembering a story just suddenly of, um, I, I had the wonderful opportunity in graduate school of taking a class with Desmond Tutu from South Africa. And Desmond Tutu said that he was bringing lots of kind of Western philosophical questions to his South African students at one time. And um, kind of questions from continental German philosophy, analytical philosophy and things. And the students just had to finally say, these are not our questions. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. <laughs> you know, and, and he said that was a, a very powerful learning moment for him that he had to step back and, and say, because he had been trained to think of these questions as the universal questions and they're not necessarily yeah, universal. They are not universal. Yeah, it depends on uh, 
uh, on a community uh, where we interacting uh, with the different people and that kind of uh, their own interests and i like that uh, teaching is now moving in that direction as more like a collaborative work because what i found from my experience uh, you never know in which position uh, you are or teacher or student <laughs> that's that's <laughs> And I, and I have students who, from so many different backgrounds that I am, that I am unfamiliar with in a lot of ways. So students who speak languages that I don't speak and students who have cultural traditions that I'm unfamiliar with. And so there's so much, the more that I can give them opportunities to write about their own experiences or to tell me about the, the music they're listening to or the, the books they love or the art they love, then I, it really expands my sense of what I might offer them in return um, so that yeah that my my sense of how to how to um, have points of contact with them is always evolving so I want to, you to ask a question because uh, this video would uh, uh, listen many people from Bosnia and Herzegovina in the region so uh, uh, in what uh, capacity are you involved in uh, culture there and uh, 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 with whom you are collaborating uh, and uh, how was that experience that kind of like <laughs> yeah. it has it has changed my life um it, it's really changed those collaborations and those contacts have um really changed the way that i teach and changed the way that i write in very profound ways um so uh, you know my, my academic training was in history i, I studied the history of religious movements and racial justice and social justice in the United States. Um, but then the more that I collaborated with Bosnians and, and the more that I got interested in human rights, um, my contacts and my interests expanded. So um, some, of the per some of the first artists I encountered were uh, visual artists like you. Um, so I, there's a painter in Chicago who was trained in Sarajevo uh, named Samir uh, Bishevic. Um, and he, I have one of his paintings here in, in my home of uh, the most, it's kind of an abstract expressionist painting of the, um, the obliteration of the Mostar Bridge. Um, it's so it kind of in a Jackson Pollock style. Um, and it just, that was one of the first pieces of art that moved me tremendously because it, it spoke to something I had, I had experienced in Mostar, um, kind of seeing Mostar in ruins um, but I had, I didn't have words for it, you know, so I was it, just meeting artists who could express things in different ways really opened my imagination. And so, because I had been trained to, um, put everything in prose, put everything in, <laughs> in nice formal sentences, um, and, and just encountering people who could tell stories in, in other ways, in very powerful ways, really was powerful to me. So the, the paint, um, the painters I've enjoyed connecting with. Um, uh, filmmakers, uh, so um, Aida Begic, uh, who's, her film Snieg is one that I show in class sometimes. I think she's a brilliant storyteller. Uh, Jasmila Zvanic, um, I show Gerbavica in, in class uh, sometimes. There's beautiful stories about women, uh, women-centered stories um, about, about women uh, kind of trying to find a way forward after losing so much um, and suffering so much. Um, I, there's another film I love called uh, Scream For Me Sarajevo. I don't know if you've had a chance to see that yet, but it's about when uh, Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden kind of uh, smuggled a band into Sarajevo during the siege and put on an amazing concert for people. Um, and so I, I love those stories of, uh, of cultural kind of resistance to fascism and to violence, you know, people saying we are human beings and we, we want to celebrate life, you know. Um, that really was beautiful to me when I visited Bosnia, was seeing that, like, that people who had suffered so much could still celebrate life and still welcome people um, into their community. Um, some other filmmakers I've, I, filmmakers I've collaborated with are um, Emir Kapitanovic and Zana Marjanovic. They've made a film recently about youth in Bosnia. It's called uh, Regeneration or Regeneratia. Um, 
and it's about youth who are trying to promote a culture of coexistence and peace building. Um, so they really, they, they're too young to remember the war, um, but, they, but they live with the consequences of it. And so they're very inspiring to me. Um, and, and I share their stories with my students about saying, look, when, like when your society maybe seems like it's falling apart or it seems like there's, there's not much you can do to, um, for progress in society, you know, here are some kids who are, who are doing, doing their best. Um, a, a lot of poets I, I've collaborated with. One, there's a wonderful poetry scene in, in Bosnia. Um, and also uh, some scholars. Uh, one of my favorite scholars to work with has been uh, Zilka Spahic Shiliak. Um, and she's an expert in human rights and gender justice. Um, and so I've done some curriculum workshops with her. Um, and then the organization I work with now, I'll just say this last, the organization I work with is called Chuvaise, which I, um, which I help manage with, uh, the founder of that organization is an American poet named Heather Durr Smith. And she's done poetry tours, uh, poetry workshops throughout Bosnia um, that have been funded by the U.S. Embassy in Bosnia, in Sarajevo. And, um, and now we're working on trying to create a youth center, a youth outreach center in Bihać, um, where youth can come for uh, activities and mentoring, but they can also do community outreach projects um, with like sports camps and um, sustainability and environmental projects. Um, to, and listening to stories and documenting stories of people who lived through the war um, and things like that. So that's, that's our big proposal. Yeah. That topic could be our next conversation. <laughs> so uh, also, I uh, I want to ask you a little bit about writing, uh, so we can uh, like uh, finish and have uh, like uh, uh, everything all together uh, as a reflection and uh, seeing writing as a something. Uh, uh, that is a tool, but also like. Uh, additional parallel <laughs> universe. So what's writing for you? Yes, oh, that, as I say, uh, my experiences in Bosnia really changed my direction as a writer. I started, I, I was wrestling with the stories and the images um, from Bosnia um, that, that I didn't really have categories for. You know, I was just it, incredible to hear the, the, the stories from people there. And, and so one, one thing I started doing was, um, taking more photographs um, and then writing based on um, just, just really um, spending time with the images from Bosnia. And so, um, you know, so I've started making some cards. I like, um, that, so I just have like this of Bosnian coffee, you know, and then and, it, um, and uh, this from a trip um, on the Neretra River, a trip from Sarajevo to Mostar. And I just have, I don't know if you could see those okay. Yeah, I, I saw it very well. But um, uh, so I, just, I started taking a lot of pictures and then writing about just what I had seen and, and, and trying to capture the voices of, of, uh, of people and stories. Um, and so I, I started writing longer um, creative nonfiction essays. Um, so essays about my travels in Bosnia and excuse me, what I had seen and what I had heard. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and just writing more and more, I think, um, personally about, and, and adding more emotion to my writing. So I, I had a, you know, I've, I've written an academic book. I have this book about religious history in the United States. Um, that's very kind of, uh, it's, it's academic historical analysis. Mm -hmm. and, it, um, and since then I've kind of shifted more toward having more emotion um, in writing. I, I, I love that book very much. It's my, it's my, but I've shifted more toward essays, toward these personal essays about, um, about the stories I've, I've heard, uh, just from wonderful people. I think about like, um, you know, what it was like to talk to people in Mostar, like um, the Elazovich family, they, they run a beautiful cafe in Mostar. Um, and just hearing about, you know, their, they're the coffee roaster they have in that in that cafe that survived the war. They kept it sheltered um, in the war and then have brought it back out. And their cafe in Mostar has become this beautiful meeting place for people. And 
And that's, those are the kinds of stories that I want to write about more and more, like how people have held on to the most beautiful parts of culture, like saying the most, the most important thing for us to rebuild is this culture of, of being together and of, um, of drinking coffee together. Of, that's another artist I'm very, I, I'm very fond of is um, Aida Shehovich, uh, who's based in New York, but she has the, the coffee cup installation that she just exhibited at um, the mobile memorial that she just um, set up at Srebrenica. Uh, just, the, just saying that how important, you know, drinking coffee together, just those simple human things, drinking coffee, planting flowers, um, going to concerts, making art, you know, those, those are the things I find myself wanting to write about more and more, especially as so many societies in the world are unraveling in way, you know, I look at Brazil is, you know, Brazil is unraveling, um, Hungary is unraveling, the Philippines, uh, Myanmar, um, you know, uh, Belarus, uh, you know, all these, uh, so many people in, in the United States, so many people are facing this situation of um, watching their society crumble um, in so many ways. And people are turning on each other, people are attacking immigrants, people are attacking vulnerable people. People are attacking democracy, um, and it's just uh, it's just we need to keep reminding ourselves of those basic that basic humanity of of coming together and honoring the um, the dignity and the value of of each person. Um, so that's the kind of writing. And then I'll sit with my students. One one little book recommendation. This is one of my favorite books. It's called Writing Down the Bones. And it's by Natalie Goldberg. And I would say for anyone who is interested in doing, doing some of this kind of personal narrative writing, writing about your own identity, your own, what, what you love, what matters most to you. It's a book full of little like two or three page prompts for that can, um, that can generate your writing process. They can be so generative of, of material. So they ask you beautiful questions like what are your, what are your deepest dreams in life? Or, um, or just sometimes one of, the, one of the best exercises is saying like, take 20 minutes or 30 minutes and just write sentences that begin with, I remember. And just, and don't edit yourself. Don't just <laughs> fill, fill pages with, I remember statements. Um, and it's amazing what kinds of things, especially with, with people of all ages, but it, it really works for my teenage students to say, you know, what do you, what do you remember from childhood? What sticks with you most that was, that was beautiful? What sticks with you most that was painful? Um, what are you, what kinds of foods do you remember? What kinds of, what kinds of foods do you miss the most? What kinds of landscapes and light do you miss most from, from where you grew up? And that so generates so much. You said that this is maybe first time that you are writing more like a personal uh, uh, things. So I'm wondering if you did some kind of personal writings when you were like maybe 20 uh, years old or something like that. Uh, have you read uh, lately anything that you uh, wrote uh, in the past? like when you were, or were in a school or something like that. How, how is your feeling about that, if you did? There were, yeah, <laughs> there <were> some, <laughs> I, wrote, I, I wrote some bad poetry in college. I, I, wrote some, <laughs> I, wrote, I took one poetry writing workshop, and, uh, but it, it taught me a lot. That workshop was incredible. I, w I wouldn't want to uh, try to publish anything that I wrote at that time. <laughs> But I learned so so much from that writing workshop about how other people uh, experience my writing and, and all the ways that other people might interpret my writing in ways that I didn't imagine. You know, so sometimes sometimes I realized I wasn't communicating very well. Other times people saw things in my writing that I didn't even see. And that's that's amazing. I mean that that some people will find beautiful things in your writing sometimes that that you didn't even realize where they were happening almost subconsciously. Um, some of the most valuable personal writing I did when I was about 20 was I took a class on, I took a class in a religious studies department on, it was called spiritual autobiography. And so we read a lot of really powerful autobiographies by people like Malcolm X, um, Dorothy Day, who was a, a, a real, a very strong uh, Catholic advocate for social justice. 
um, and other, you know, other writers who wrote very poetically about what matters most in life. Uh, Thomas Merton is another American writer, great spiritual writer. And then at the end of the class, we were asked to write a 20 page kind of autobiography about ourselves, do, do 20 pages of writing about ourselves. And it was honestly one of the toughest pieces of writing that I had to do in college because it was so new for me. I was very good at writing academic papers, very good at writing historical analysis, literary analysis. Um, but I had never really been asked to write about myself. Um, and so just thinking through all those questions of who is my audience for this? Um, what, what do I want to convey? I think that started me in this direction. And then just I ended up finding some stories later on that I wanted to tell. And one of the first, one of the first little essays I wrote about Bosnians was um, about just running into a Bosnian couple out in the western part of the United States where I would never expect to meet Bosnians. Um, but I, uh, I just stumbled into a cafe one day and uh, um, the woman who was one of the owners who greeted me just asked me, you know, to take, she said, take your time, just whenever you're ready to order, let me know. And, and just, <laughs> this, I had this experience of saying, I think, you know, I, I eventually started a, a short conversation with her, but I ended up finally asking, are you Bosnian? <laughs> and, and she was, I just, it was this, this incredibly strange experience of, of just hearing the the rhythms and the cadences of the speech, and she was so kind and a certain and um, that she, just the way she talked just immediately brought me back to Bosnia, and um, and so we so I've become friends with them and talked with them over the years, and I ended up wanting to write about just what it felt like a miracle um, discovering their their little cat this tiny little cafe in Salt Lake City, Utah, where. Um, I was having a pretty bad day and it was like the thing, it was like the universe knew that the thing I needed most was to, um, to find a Bosnian cafe. <laughs> so I just, I was like, I want to write this story. Like, how do I tell this story of, you know, of, of why these people meant so much to me and, and um, why it was such, so beautiful to encounter them. So uh, we are, uh... Uh, we are recording almost <laughs> 35 minutes. Oh my God. It's, it's great. So uh, I want you to say some kind of uh, suggestion for uh, young writers, mm -hmm. like any kind of tip that uh, you learn the, from your experience of writing and reflecting personal stories. Oh. Anything. <laughs> question uh, and I think it's it's something's coming to mind to me there's there's a wonderful writer of memoir named Mary Carr K-A-R-R -R. and she she says about memoir she's got a book called The Art of Memoir and with lots of wonderful suggestions about this kind of writing but it really comes down to kind of authenticity just really write, writing about what deeply moves you and matters to you most in terms of your story and in terms of what you want to convey to people and writing about it in a way that connects you to others so it's um so if you really think about audience a little bit and, and you imagine you're writing as a conversation with others sometimes you need to write just by yourself sometimes sometimes you're not ready to share it yet and that's, I think, especially important for teenagers to hear. Sometimes maybe it's enough just to journal. Um, but if you can find a way, if you can find supportive peers and adults who will take your stories seriously, um, that's one of the most beautiful ways, I think, that we can connect with other people. And one of the most beautiful ways that we can get through tough times is to know that people, um, people really do care about what matters to you. And uh, so, yeah, if you can kind of mine your own experience and your own deep loves and deep dreams, um, even some of your own pain um, in a way that connects you to others, I think that's our best hope for, for surviving what's so hard in this world. 
Yeah, I, I love that. I would uh, finish with uh, finish with that thought, and uh, I'm uh, grateful that uh, we are able to talk about so many different topics. And uh, I can say my favorite one is about teaching. So mm -hmm. it's really uh, <laughs> responsible and uh, kind of a big role that uh, it's important uh, in today's world. So I'm uh, I want to thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And let me, oh, let me say my shirt is from a Sarajevan streetwear company called Revolt, and I love their designs. And it's, <laughs> so that's <laughs> from, from, uh, from Sarajevo. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. <laughs>